kids do well if they can, not kids do well if they wanna. And guess what? Parents do well if they can, and teachers do well if they can. So if you are new to my weekly show, I am Charmaine Tanner. We are going to be talking about the difference between kids if they can or kids if they want to. Um, I am very excited about our show today. Just a little bit about myself. I'm a parent of a son with Down syndrome. I'm a retired teacher and an advocate for students with disabilities. Today, we are so honored that Dr. Ross Green is with us. Um, I'm sure many of you know of him and may have heard him speak before. He is a clinical psychologist. He was on the staff of the Harvard Medical School for more than 20 years. Um, he's an international speaker and author. Um, one of his first books was Lost at School. And one of his more recent ones <laughs> is Raising Human Beings. And it's like so much of a glare you can't see. Um, and also, we're, I'm going to be giving away one copy of this today. So um, stay tuned for that. But I want to acknowledge the wisdom, the insights um, that Dr. Green has. He's the founder of Lives in the Balance. Um, and so he is going to be with us today. He'll be presenting for about 90 minutes, and then we'll have about 20, 25 minutes for Q&A. Um, so Dr. Green, welcome to our show today. Charmaine, thank you for having me on. It's going to be a great day. I'm going to bring up your slides and let you get started. Now, the, the primary focal point about what I'm going to be talking about today is, of course, my model, Collaborative and Proactive Solutions. But I'm also going to sprinkle quite heavily a dose of um, how Collaborative and Proactive Solutions um, is very good at reducing or eliminating our use of restraint and seclusion, um, which are still, unfortunately, very popular interventions, uh, especially in schools. Um, and that's not blaming anybody. That's just saying, um, if we're going to turn that around, and if we're going to turn things around in general with our most vulnerable kids, those with social, emotional, and behavioral challenges, we're going to need new lenses, we're going to need new timing, and we're going to need new practices. Um, yet another kid uh, died about three weeks ago being restrained, this kid in a school in Michigan. This is actually not that uncommon of an occurrence. And it is an occurrence that should be happening zero. Um, but that requires, once again, new lenses, new timing, and new practices, as you shall soon see. So let's get started. The new lenses. Charmaine, as you've already told us, the key overarching theme of the entire model is kids do all if they can. This is the belief that if this kid could do well, the kid would do well. If a kid is not doing well, something must be getting in the kid's way. And what the research tells us is getting in the kid's way is lagging skills. And there's your new lenses, because for a very long time, We've been thinking that kids with behavioral challenges were lacking motivation. And that is why we've been saying all kinds of things about them that flow from that belief system, motivation or unmotivated. Um, and when you know that a kid is instead lacking skills, the vocabulary changes, the language changes. A lot of educators in particular, but parents as well, tell us that when you start implementing this model, the language changes, the lenses change how we talk about kids change when we view them differently. So the overarching theme is kids do all if they can. But um, that's not what we've been believing for a very long time. Uh, we've been thinking something else. And Charmaine, you already told us about this one too. It's, it's kids do all if they wanna. Now kids do all if they can and kids do all if they wanna are two completely different mentalities. 
and they have completely different implications for what you're thinking about this kid and what you're doing with the kid or to the kid to try to help the kid. Let's think about kids do all if they want to just because it's popular, not because it's right. If you have a kids do all if they want a mentality and you're working with a kid who's not doing well, then the reason you think the kid isn't doing well is because the kid doesn't want to do well. Um, I was pretty much trained to think that way. Uh, but very early in my training, I started asking myself some very important questions like, why would the kid not want to do well? Don't all of us do pretty much the best we can in pretty much most of the circumstances we find ourselves in? Well, um, there's a lot of things we say about behaviorally challenging kids that flow from the belief that they're not doing well because it's working for them, getting them something, helping them escape or avoid something. Um, it's um, life is going better for them because they're not, not doing well. How, how could that be? How, would let, how, how is it that they could do well, but they just don't want to? Well, there's all kinds of things we say about these kids. None of them are true to justify our belief that somehow doing poorly is working out better for the kid than doing well would. And that includes characterizations like attention seeking, manipulative, coercive, unmotivated, limit testing. None of them are true. If a kid could seek attention adaptively, the kid would seek attention adaptively. I've yet to come across a kid who had the skills to seek attention adaptively, but was choosing to seek attention maladaptively because that was making the kid's life go better. Competent manipulation requires a whole bunch of skills, forethought, planning, impulse control, organization, that the research tells us most behaviorally challenging kids lack. He's coercing us into capitulating to his wishes. You mean, he wants what he wants and he's pulling out all the stops to go for it. My experience tells me that kids start doing that the minute they are born. That's right. Infants want what they want and they pull out all the stops to go for it. And that's crucial to their survival. But what we hope happens as a child develops, there's a very important word, is that the child develops the skills to go about getting what he or she wants in ways that are skillful, in ways that are adaptive. Skills like empathy and um, appreciating how one's behavior is affecting other people and taking another person's perspective skills the research tells us a very high percentage of behaviorally challenging kids lack he's unmotivated i would never say that about anybody why not because here's what i've learned the minute we figure out what skills a kid is lacking and the minute we figure out what expectations a child is reliably having difficulty meeting. We find that unmotivated doesn't even come close to capturing what's really going on with this kid. The trick, of course, look, and in the collaborative and proactive solutions model, taking a closer look means using an instrument that we call the assessment of lagging skills and unsolved problems. And um, I'll be reviewing it briefly uh, during this webinar, but you can learn a whole lot more about it on the website of my nonprofit, Lives in the Balance. That's where you'll find not only the assessment of lagging skills and unsolved problems, but also uh, instructions on how to use it. Um, cover one more thing that's not true. He's testing limits. I find that we all test limits. So saying that this kid is testing limits is saying something that's true of everybody. And yet somehow or another, these characterizations frequently find their way into our functional behavior assessments and frequently color our thinking about what's going on with these kids. And why is that a big deal? Because if you think a kid isn't doing well because he doesn't want to do well, I can only think of one thing for you to do, only one role for you to play in the life of this kid, make the kid want to do well. And how do you do that? What I'm about to say is very popular, um, very widespread. The, you reward the behaviors you like so as to see more of them. You punish 
the behaviors you don't like so as to see less of them. And you are now in the business of making a kid want to do well, founded on the belief that the kid didn't want to do well in the first place. Goodness, those lenses are really important. They um, affect how we're viewing the kid and they affect how we're trying to go about helping the kid. Kids do well if they can, says if this kid could do well, this kid would do well. Something must be getting in the kid's way, and now you know what's getting in the kid's way. The kid is lacking skills. There's your new lenses. And the kid has specific expectations that he or she is having difficulty meeting. That's what you're going to be working on. That's what you are going to be trying to find solutions to collaboratively and proactively. Another big part of your new lens is it, it coincides with what I've just said is that doing well is preferable. Now, um, for me, that's a statement of the obvious. Of course, doing well is preferable. Um, most people I know do well most of the time because they prefer it. Here's the, here's the tricky part. So do behaviorally challenging kids. We, we are often saying about these kids that doing poorly is somehow working out well for them. They would very much, first of all, I've never seen doing poorly work out well for anybody, not over the long term. But secondly, they would actually prefer to be doing well. Um, if you ask me, what are the two most important things for doing well in this life? Uh, my answer would be, if, if I was only limited to two, it would be a preference for doing well and the skills to pull it off. Problem is... For a very long time, we've been focused on the preference part. And that is why we are so busy incentivizing kids to behave the way we want them be, to, to, to behave. We're using motivational strategies. Um, but what if the kid prefers doing well already and is lacking the skills to do it? Then our approach would be completely different. There isn't a shred of research telling us that behaviorally challenging kids prefer doing poorly. That, that research doesn't exist. There is a mountain of research telling us they are lacking skills. So it is crucial that we come to view kids with social, emotional, and behavioral challenges through the prism of lagging skills, there's your lenses, and unmet expectations, or, or what we call in this model unsolved problems. That's what you're working on. Your new lenses. This kid would very much prefer to be doing well. Kids do well if they can. This kid does not need more incentives from you. This kid needs something else from you. Those are your new lenses. Let's think a little bit about your new practices. And this is, this is just as crucial. Um, many of us, me included, we're trained to primarily focus on a challenging kid's challenging behavior. And we were trained to try to modify the kid's behavior. And not only is that very popular, it's what we've been doing for a very long time. It's also not what you're going to be doing when you're implementing the collaborative and proactive solutions approach. Because in this model, instead of focusing on behavior and modifying it, you instead focus on the problems that are causing those behaviors and solving them. In this model, you are a problem solver. Now, if you're an educator, you've always been a problem solver when it comes to academics. Why so many of us wear completely different lenses and conduct ourselves in a completely different manner when we're dealing with the challenging behaviors that are often the result of the struggles kids are having to meet our academic demands? I have no idea. My attitude? If you're a problem solver on academics, you're a problem solver on the challenging behaviors that are frequently being caused when kids are struggling with those academics. For me, academics and behavior go hand in glove. They are inseparable. My estimate, and I'm gathering data on this now, is that about 80%, this is anecdotal for now until I have the data, about 80% of the behavior problems that occur in a school can be traced back in one way or another to academics. The other 20% is social. If you're a problem solver on academics, 
you're a problem solver on the challenging behaviors that are frequently caused when students are struggling with those academics. If you're an educator, you've been a problem solver all along. See, in this model, behavior is just the signal, just the fever, just the means by which the kid is communicating something very important. You don't want to miss this. I'm stuck. There are expectations I'm having difficulty meeting. That's all behavior is. If you've heard that behavior, all behavior is communication, now you know what it's communicating. I'm stuck. There are expectations I'm having difficulty meeting. Um, that's what behavior communicates. If all we're busy doing is modifying behavior, we never figure out what those expectations are, what those unsolved problems are, and we never get around to solving them because we're so busy modifying signals. In other words, if all we're busy doing is modifying signals, we're not going to solve any problems that way. Now, here's the good news. When you are busy solving problems collaboratively and proactively, not only are you solving the problems that are causing the behavior, but you are also causing the behavior to subside because you see it is only unsolved problems that cause challenging behavior. Solved problems don't. Now, if you were trained the way I was behaviorally way back in the day, then you know that the reason we've been focusing on behavior for so long is because B.F. Skinner told us a very long time ago that behavior is the only thing that's observable, the only thing that's objective, the only thing that's quantifiable. And B.F. Skinner did say that. We sometimes forget that B.F. Skinner also talked every bit as much about the conditions in which those behaviors occur. By the way, those conditions are just as observable, just as objective, just as quantifiable. In this model, you are focused on those conditions. You are not focused on the behaviors that are occurring in those conditions. But we don't call them conditions in this model. We're not allergic to the term. It's just not what we call them. We also don't call them antecedents, although that's even roughly synonymous. Our preferred terms, you've already heard them, are either unmet expectations. When do all human beings look bad? When there are expectations, they're having difficulty meeting. And by the way, we all look bad sometimes, and that is when we all look bad, behaviorally challenging kids included. When there are expectations, we are having difficulty meeting. So unmet expectations is the perfect term for what B.F. Skinner was referring to when he was referring to conditions. But as you've already heard, the preferred term is actually unsolved problems. Also known, by the way, as problems that have yet to be solved. Also known, by the way, as problems that are waiting to be solved. Waiting for who? Waiting for you. But not if all you're focused on is the kids' signals, behaviors. What I often say to people who teach in a high school is that what's walking in your door is big piles of unsolved problems. How the piles get so big. Well, if the folks who had the kid before you were only focused on the kid's behavior, then they weren't focused on solving the problems that were causing that behavior. And that's how you cause the pile of unsolved problems to just continue to grow. Some of those unsolved problems are 10 years old. I'm not talking about the chronological age of the kid. I'm talking about how long that kid's been struggling to meet that expectation. Can you imagine 10 year old unsolved problems? Can you imagine being a high school teacher with lots of kids who are walking in the door with big piles of unsolved problems? Can you imagine being that kid who's been struggling to meet certain very identifiable expectations for a really long time? That'll cause you to lose hope. That'll cause you to lose faith in the adult species. When I'm talking to middle and high, junior high school teachers, I tell them what's walking in your door is big piles of unsolved problems. Some of those unsolved problems are six to eight years old. Once again, I'm not talking about the chronological age of the kid. I'm talking about how long the kid's been having difficulty meeting that expectation. Can you imagine? And of course, if you work in an elementary school or work with um, preschoolers or even younger, 
um, well, that's when the problems often first start to show themselves. And that's when the behaviors often first start to show themselves. And if all you're focused on is the behaviors, the problems remain unidentified and unsolved. So focusing on problems instead of behaviors is going to require different assessment practices. Because you know what primarily gets assessed when we're dealing with a behaviorally challenging kid in a school, but also everywhere else, we assess the kid's behavior, the signals. We do behavior checklists. We do behavior observations. We, we do functional behavior assessments, all so that we can come up with a behavior plan, all focused on the signal. Not in this model. In this model, you're going to be using the assessment of lagging skills and unsolved problems so that you get the right lenses on, those are the lagging skills, and so that you know what you're working on instead of behavior, those are the unsolved problems. More on new practices. Now that you are in the problem solving business, got to think about what kind of problem solver you want to be. We adults tend to be real keen on problem solving of the unilateral kind. That's where the adult decides what the solution is and imposes it on the kid. It's also not what you're doing in this model. In this model, we operate on a very important assumption. You want to solve a problem with a kid? You're going to need a teammate. You're going to need a partner. Who's your partner? The kid. And by the way, generally speaking, that kid is going to be delighted to help you out. That kid's been wondering for a very long time, how come we adults keep trying to make things better? Without the kid's input, without the kid's ideas, without the kid's involvement, without the kid's sign-off, this is problem solving of the collaborative kind. It's something you're doing with the kid, not to the kid. That's huge. And now another crucial part of your new practices, new timing. As you all know, a great deal of the intervention that occurs for behaviorally challenging kids occurs in the heat of the moment, emergently, reactively, not in this model. 99.9% uh, .9 of what you're doing in this model is planned, proactive. Now come the logical questions. How can we be planned and proactive when we never know when the kid's gonna blow? when he's always getting upset from out of the blue, when she's so unpredictable, here are the answers. Uh, the kid is not blowing up from out of the blue. Uh, he's not um, unpredictable. You know exactly when she is going to blow if you answer two questions right up front. And those two questions are those two questions are the questions that the assessment of lagging skills and unsolved problems are going to help you answer. Why and when? As in, why are challenging kids challenging? Why is this challenging kid challenging? When are challenging kids challenging? When is this challenging kid challenging? I'm sorry to report that those are frequently not the two questions we tend to focus on when we are talking about these kids in our meetings, amongst ourselves, those questions begin with the word, what? I'll get to those in a second. Let's, let's do why first. I don't like to keep people in suspense. Why are challenging kids challenging? Here is the answer that has been provided to us by the last 40 to 50 years of research. And believe it or not, those 40 to 50 years of research can be summarized in one sentence. And here it is, it's up on the screen. Challenging kids are challenging because they're lacking the skills to not be challenging. That's what the research tells us. Notice I didn't say anything about the kid's level of motivation. That's not it. Notice I didn't say anything about what neighborhood the kid comes from. That might not be helping, but that's not it. There are well-behaved kids coming out of the same neighborhood. Notice I didn't say anything about the kid's family. We've been blaming parents for the behavioral challenges of their children for a very long time. I used to until I noticed that in virtually every family that I was working with, there were also well-behaved kids in the home. 
Nope. What the research tells us is that challenging kids are challenging because they're lacking the skills to not be challenging. That's why it's really good that the assessment of lagging skills and unsolved problems helps us figure out what skills the kid is lacking. There's your new lenses. There's your answer to the question why. When are challenging kids challenging? Uh, under the same exact conditions that the rest of us are, at least in the abstract. We all look bad sometimes. We've established that already. When do we look bad? Under the same conditions, at least in the abstract, that behaviorally challenging kids look bad. And when is that? When expectations outstrip skills. It's when we all look bad. And now you know, in other words, when there's an expectation, they're having difficulty meeting. In other words, in response to what we call unsolved problems. And now you know the most, two most important things you need to know to start doing things differently as it relates to your work with behaviorally challenging kids. Challenging kids are challenging because they're lacking the skills to not be challenging. We all look bad when expectations outstrip skills. Now to what we usually talk about. What questions, as in, what behaviors is the kid exhibiting to communicate that he or she is having difficulty meeting certain expectations? Not a very productive question to answer because all you're talking about then are the kid's signals. What, by the way, you don't need a meeting to figure out what the kid's signals are. You already know, and you've known for a very long time. We shouldn't be talking about behavior in our meetings. What should we be talking about in our meetings? lagging skills, unsolved problems. Here's another what thing we should not be talking about in our meetings. What psychiatric disorder does the kid meet diagnostic criteria for on the basis of the behaviors the kid is exhibiting to communicate that he or she is having difficulty meeting certain expectations? Also not especially informative. Now, we sometimes pretend that the diagnosis answers the question why, but when we do that, we're just faking it. Um, I've worked with a lot of kids diagnosed with ADHD. Um, they all had very different lagging skills and unsolved problems. Worked with a lot of kids diagnosed with oppositional defiant disorder. They all had very different lagging skills and unsolved problems. Worked with a lot of kids on the autism spectrum. They all had very different lagging skills and unsolved problems specific to them. Um, don't pretend that the diagnosis answers the question why. I was, I tell this story sometimes. I was speaking in Denmark about a year and a half ago at an autism conference, and a mother um, very timidly raised her hand and she said, So I found my daughter's autism diagnosis to be very useful. I said, Good. She said, But I think what you're saying is that um, my daughter's autism diagnosis really doesn't tell me anything about her specific lagging skills and unsolved problems. I said, right. She pondered it a bit further and then she said, and I think what you're telling us is that once we figure out what the lagging skills and unsolved problems are, the diagnosis isn't really going to tell us very much at all. Right. Now, might you need a diagnosis for your child or for your student to access services because many, if not most school systems still need a psychiatric disorder as the gatekeeper for services, placement, funding. You might still need that, um, but I view that as a formality, one that you might, a hurdle that you might have to clear, but a formality. It opens the gate, but it doesn't tell you anything about this specific kid's specific lagging skills and unsolved problems. Even better news. Once you figure out what a kid's lagging skills and unsolved problems are, that kid is now highly predictable and intervention can be almost exclusively proactive. In other words, an unsolved problem is only a surprise the first time it happens. After that, it's not a surprise anymore. This is all why I don't really put a lot of faith in psychiatric disorders. 
Uh, I think that if we need categories, and I'm not sure that we do, but if we do, I think we only need two. My two categories are lucky and unlucky. What are lucky ways of communicating? That you're having difficulty meeting certain expectations? Um, well, uh, the, here's the holy grail of lucky. Using your words. Doesn't get any better than that. But also whining, pouting, sulking, withdrawing, crying. Why are those ways of communicating that you're having difficulty meeting certain expectations lucky? Those ways aren't going to get you popped into timeout. They're not going to get you held in from recess, not going to get you kept after school, not going to get you um, a detention, suspension, expulsion, not going to get you hit either in the form of a spanking at home or as we still do hundreds of thousands of times in American public schools in 19 different states here in the year 2020, hitting you on the butt with a piece of wood, not going to get you pinned to the ground by two to four big adults and what is commonly known, God knows why, as a therapeutic hold, I'll be using the word restraint, not going to get you thrown into a locked padded room. But best of all, those ways of communicating that you're having difficulty meeting certain expectations are highly likely to elicit empathy from your caregivers. Lucky you, kid. Hmm. But that's not who I've been working with for the last 40 plus years. I've been working with the unlucky variety. What are unlucky ways of communicating that you're having difficulty meeting certain expectations? You already know, but here's a sampling. Screaming, swearing, hitting, spitting, kicking, biting, throwing, destroying, running. Worse, behaviors that are severely injurious to oneself or others. Cutting, self-induced vomiting, drinking to excess, drugging to excess, ending one's own life or trying, ending somebody else's life, or trying. Why are those ways of communicating that you're having difficulty meeting certain expectations unlucky? Well, those ways are far more likely to get you popped into timeout, held in from recess, kept after school, detention. Now we're moving down in the severity realm, suspension, expulsion, hit, pinned, thrown. But worst of all, those ways of communicating that you're having difficulty meeting certain expectations are far less likely to elicit empathy from your caregivers. Even though the field of developmental psychopathology has been telling us for a very long time that whether you are communicating that you're having difficulty meeting expectations in ways that are lucky or unlucky, your behavior is communicating the exact same thing. Here's that line again. I'm stuck. There are expectations I'm having difficulty meeting. But the things we do to kids still here in the year 2020, by virtue of the fact that they are communicating that they're having difficulty meeting expectations in ways that are unlucky, not just unlucky, unconscionable, unnecessary. And unfortunately, we're still training people to do that stuff. So now what I consider to be perhaps the most important slide of this presentation. This is the cycle of restraint and seclusion. But quite frankly, it's not just pertinent to restraint and seclusion. It's the cycle of the, all the things we do that are punitive. The colors of the bubbles are meaningful. Everything in blue is early. Everything proactive. Everything in red is late. Reactive. You don't want to be late. You want to be early. If you're early, you are in true crisis prevention mode. If you are late, um, you are in crisis management mode. What's early? Figuring out what expectations a kid is having difficulty meeting proactively. What are this kid's unsolved problems? And solving those problems proactively. When we do that, we never find ourselves in the red. Unfortunately, that is not what we mostly do. What do we mostly do? 
well, Redbubble number one kicks it off. Um, what What is the prototypical adult response when a kid is having difficulty meeting a particular expectation? Push the kid harder. Insist harder. Based, I think, on the premise that pushing kids harder elicits better performance and everybody wants to get the most out of every kid. Uh, problem is, not by my experience, that pushing kids harder to meet expectations they cannot reliably meet elicits better performance. My experience is that pushing kids harder to meet expectations they cannot reliably meet elicits behavior. Red bubble number two, behavior, um, whereby the kid is communicating something we already knew. He can't reliably meet that expectation. And if we'd have figured out what expectations the kid was having difficulty meeting proactively, we would have known that already. And the behavior would not have occurred. And then we wouldn't be in the position to have to respond to the behavior. Let me make, be more explicit. The behavior is late. When you're responding to behavior, you are responding to what's late. When you are modifying behavior, you are modifying what's late. You're in crisis management mode. If the behaviors are of a certain type, the unlucky kind, what do you do next? You do what you've been trained to do. And this is what we're still very busy training people how to do. Red bubble number three, you de-escalate the kid. Um, boy, are you late now? Or you're in the thick of it now. You're de-escalating. And why is it, is there a fair chance at least, that your de-escalation efforts are going to fail? Well, number one, he's already hot because you're late. And number two, you're late. Um, when your de-escalation efforts fail, what do you do next? You de you um, restrain the kid or you seclude the kid. That's what you do next. All in the name of, and by the way, now you're very, very late, all in the name of safety. Isn't this fascinating? We've been taught, that's right, we've been taught. We're still training people to believe that restraint and seclusion keep kids safer. I'm aware of no data telling us that restraint and seclusion keep kids or anybody else safer. In fact, my experience tells me that it's when you're restraining or secluding a kid that kids and adults get hurt. Very important slide. Very important to know that everything in red is crisis management. So I want to make sure you know about a website recently launched by my nonprofit, Lives in the Balance, truecrisisprevention.org. Truecrisisprevention.org. It is where you will find lots of free resources, and we're going to be continuing to add to that website frequently um, on how to uh, end the cycle of restraint and seclusion, and therefore how to dramatically reduce and ultimately eliminate the use of restraint and seclusion. Very important slide. You don't want to be late. You want to be early. What's early? The things we're going to be talking about next. Figuring out what expectations the kid is having difficulty meeting. What are the kids' unsolved problems? And solving those problems collaboratively and proactively. That's how you stay out of the red. So I basically just covered this, but what are the two most important roles that caregivers can play in the lives of behaviorally challenging kids? Both are very important. Don't skip the first one just because you're in a hurry to get to the second one. Role number one, figure out what this kid's lagging skills and unsolved problems are. Pretty surefire bet, by the way, that if this kid is still behaviorally challenging, nobody's figured that out yet. How do you do it? The assessment of lagging skills and unsolved problems. What's it going to help you accomplish? Lagging skills are your lenses. They replace all of those other things we talked about earlier. Um, unsolved problems are what you are going to be trying to solve when you get around to solving them. That's bullet number two. And as I've already mentioned, but worth repeating, 
Once you know what a kid's lagging skills and unsolved problems are, this kid is highly predictable and intervention can be almost exclusively proactive. And now you are no longer walking on eggshells. This is not a walk on eggshells model. Walking on eggshells is when you know you're doing stuff that's going to cause the kid to blow and you're trying very hard not to do that stuff. I'd rather know what the kid's unsolved problems are than have you walking on eggshells and have it remain a mystery. This is not a picking your battles model. And in this, you're not battling in this model. There is no battling in this model. And um, when you're implementing collaborative and proactive solutions, you're not feeling like you're in perpetual survival mode anymore bouncing from one crisis to another. Role number two, once you've figured out what those unsolved problems are, start solving them, but do it in a way collaboratively and proactively that is going to promote a problem-solving partnership. You're not flying solo here. Um, this is not adversarial. This is not enemies. This is a partnership between you and the kid. When you're solving problems collaboratively and proactively, you are engaging kids in solving the problems that affect their lives, a skill this kid's gonna need for the rest of his life. Why would you wanna lead the kid out of the loop on that? When you're solving problems collaboratively and proactively, you and the kid are together coming up with solutions that are a whole lot more effective and a whole lot more durable because you're not flying solo. And perhaps best of all, this is what the research coming out of Australia is telling us these days. When you are solving problems collaboratively and proactively, yes, you're solving the problems. And yes, because the problems are solved, they're not going to cause challenging behavior anymore. But the mere process of engaging kids in solving problems collaboratively and proactively also enhances their skills. So you are pretty much off the hook for explicitly teaching skills in this model. A lot of the skills these kids are lacking uh, that are causing them to become unlucky, there's actually no technology for teaching those skills. You'll see what those skills are in a few minutes. Um, fortunately, solving problems collaboratively and proactively, the mere process of engaging kids in that, in that process helps enhance their skills. You're off the hook for teaching skills explicitly. You are, it's unlike some other, some more academic learning challenges. Um, if a kid's having difficulty reading, what are you going to do? Teach them to read. Going to teach that skill directly and explicitly. Kids having trouble writing, what are you going to do? Uh, maybe teach that skill or find some assistive technology so the kid can write another way, explicitly. Uh, but if a kid is having difficulty separating the thinking one must do in response to a problem or frustration from the emotions one is experiencing in response to that problem or frustration, I know of no technology for teaching that, that skill. Fortunately, kids are going to have that skill be enhanced just by engaging them in the process of solving problems collaboratively and proactively. So it's all good. You're solving the problem because you did that. You're reducing the challenging behavior and you are simultaneously enhancing skills. It's what I refer to as a three for one sale. This is the assessment of lagging skills and unsolved problems. One sheet, it's available on the Lines and the Balance website in an editable, fillable format so that you can type instead of write and save and share electronically. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about the instrument. Um, down the left-hand side is a list of lagging skills. Down the right-hand side is where you're going to be writing in unsolved or typing in unsolved problems. It's not an exhaustive list of lagging skills. It's a representative list of lagging skills. If I had tried to be exhaustive about all the skills the research tells us unlucky kids could be lacking, the ALSIP would be 10 to 15 pages long. You don't need 10 to 15 pages of lagging skills to get the right lenses on. You need 23 lagging skills. These are just the lagging skills I see most often in behaviorally challenging kids. 23, they'll help you get the right lenses on. Um, checking off lagging skills is easy. 
writing in unsolved problems, those of you who've tried to use this instrument already know this, is a bit harder. That's why I want to make sure that you um, get on the Lives in the Balance website, livesinthebalance.org. Go to the, either the walking tour for educators or the walking tour for parents and go to the second section in both of the walking tours. The walking tours are filled with streaming video and audio programming so that um, to take you way beyond what we're going to be able to cover in an hour and a half or two in this uh, training. Um, and then you'll know how to use the assessment of lagging skills and unsolved problems. And um, then the assessment of lagging skills and unsolved problems should become the standard pre-referral triage instrument in every school. I don't care what you call the meeting, student assessment team, student study team, child study, tier two meeting, whatever you call the meeting, what should be in the meeting. And the primary th is the assessment of lagging skills and unsolved problems. And the primary topic of discussion should be lagging skills and unsolved problems. Not behavior, that's just the signal. Not diagnosis, that's just a rough summary of the signals. Not adult theories about how the kid got to be this way. Our theories are frequently wrong. And the reality is you probably can't do much about the factors that caused the kid to be this way in the first place. So we don't want to spend much meeting time on that either, much if any. No storytelling in this meeting. Stories are usually about the kid's behavior. Nope. If we really want to get to know this kid, if we really want to get the right lenses on, we've got to know what the kid's lagging skills are. And if we really want to know what we're working on, we've got to write in very specific expectations that the kid is having difficulty meeting unsolved problems. ALSIP meetings should take about 50 to 55 minutes, um, sometimes longer as you're getting good at this or longer if a kid just has a mountain of unsolved problems, believe it or not. Once you learn about how to word unsolved problems, it's, it's a pretty good chance that kids who've been behaviorally challenging for a very long time are going to have 40, 50, 60 different unsolved problems, believe it or not. And that can be overwhelming. But I'll tell you what's even more overwhelming, having absolutely no idea what those unsolved problems are. That's overwhelming. Because now all you can focus on is the kid's behavior, the signal because you still don't know what the kid's unsolved problems are and therefore don't know what problems you could be busy solving with this kid if only you knew what they were. Once again, I'll repeat this because this is crucial. And by the way, the instrument's free, so I have no financial stake in having people use the instrument. Uh, I have a humane stake in having people use the instrument. Um, this should be the standard pre-referral triage instrument in every meeting, in every school where we're talking about kids who are struggling. This is the instrument. We've got to know what their lagging skills are so we have the right lenses on. We've got to know what their unsolved problems are so we know what we could be working on with them and busy solving collaboratively and proactively. What do we hope happens in an ALSIP meeting? We hope people, we hope light bulbs go on. We hope people say, Wow, as in, wow, this kid really is lacking a lot of skills. That is a beautiful wow moment, especially when it is uttered from the lips of someone who wasn't thinking that when they walked into the meeting. Wow, no wonder what we've been doing hadn't been working. That is a beautiful wow moment, especially when it is uttered from the lips of someone who came into the meeting thinking we should just keep doing what hadn't been working for the last three years. Maybe it'll take at some point. This next one often comes with a rather shaken up look attached. Wow. I'm kind of feeling bad about how I've been treating him. Now, what's that person all shook up about? Well, they are now simultaneously reflecting on what they now know about this kid and how they've been treating him. And they are coming to the recognition that those two do not square up. More wow moments. So you're saying he only gets upset when these unsolved problems pop up? That's right. And you're saying these unsolved problems don't pop up? We know they're coming. Well, that's right. Any, any unsolved problem you've written or typed in on the assessment of lagging skills and unsolved problems is by definition predictable. Or you wouldn't have been able to write it in. 
And you're saying that if we solve these problems with him, he won't get upset over them anymore? Right. And you're saying we don't have to wait till the problem pops up before we solve them. We can solve them proactively. Bingo. As I say to the educators I work with, I am going to get you out of the heat of the moment. I'm going to get you out of the red and into the blue. I should write a song by that title. <laughs> out of red into the blue. I do a little piano. I'm capable of this. Your next goal. Because this kid could have 40, 50, 60 different unsolved problems, especially if he's been unlucky for a long time. As I mentioned earlier, those unsolved problems do tend to accumulate. Somebody's got to write that down, out of the red and into the blue. Maybe there's a song by that name already. Maybe it's relevant. We'll have to find out. I'll check in Audible after we're done. Not Audible. Um, Spotify. Your next goal is to prioritize. You can't work on 40, 50, 60 different unsolved problems at once. Um, you're actually never going to be working on more than two or three unsolved problems at any given point in time, which is why a kid who has 40, 50, 60 unsolved problems shouldn't really be that overwhelming because you're going to prioritize. You are not expected to solve the 40, 50, 60 different unsolved problems that you inherited, that have, that have accumulated over the last God knows how long, in a week, two or three at a time. How do you prioritize? Here's my algorithm, um, if you want an algorithm. Safety first. Any unsolved problems causing safety issues is a high priority. Uh, this is a safety first model. Safety is a big deal in schools these days and homes these days. Plus, very hard to get people to work together on solving problems if one or both of them is feeling unsafe. Safety first. If we don't have safety issues, we're either going with frequency, the unsolved problems that are setting in motion incompatible, uh, challenging episodes most often, or gravity, the unsolved problems that are having the greatest negative impact on this kid's life or the lives of others. You get to pick three. By the way, if you're having difficulty picking, and uh, the, the algorithm usually helps people pick, but if you're having difficulty picking, here's your strategy. Lay the ALSIP face up on a flat surface. Sharpen a pencil. Hold the pencil over the ALSIP. Drop it three times. And wherever it lands, start there. See, here's the deal. While that algorithm is important for helping you prioritize, it is actually more important that you get started on solving problems than it is which unsolved problems you get started on. So don't split hairs on picking unsolved problems. And by the way, the kid can help you pick unsolved problems too. You might want to identify five or six that you think are a high priority and not let the kid pick the two or three that the kid wants to work on first. No downside. In fact, it's engaging the kid in the process right from the word go. No downside. How are you keeping track? The problem solving plan. Also available on the Lives in the Balance website in an editable, fillable format so that once again, you can type instead of write and save and share electronically. What you're seeing here is three columns, three identical columns, each representing a distinct unsolved problem. Top box in each column, what is the unsolved problem? So this is how you are keeping track of what you are working on right now with this kid. And by process of elimination, what you are not working on right now with this kid. Box number two is also crucial. Who's taking primary responsibility for solving that problem with that kid? You gotta designate somebody, but especially if you're working in a school, designating somebody is gonna be easy. And by the way, uh, we're not going to be designating the assistant principal or principal, nor the school psychologist, nor the school social worker, nor the school counselor. The person who's going to take the lead on solving the problem with this kid is the person whose expectation the kid is having difficulty meeting. When you hear the three steps of solving a problem collaboratively and proactively, it will make crystal clear sense why that person why we cannot solve that problem without that person. Of course, since this is collaborative, we also can't solve it without the kid. 
But for too long, we've been punting, referring our unsolved problems to somebody else, somebody else who, when you hear the three steps that are involved in solving a problem collaboratively, actually that person couldn't possibly solve the problem for you. And that is why this model also has a pretty stellar track record for dramatically reducing or eliminating problem solving referrals, excuse me, discipline referrals. We replace them with problem solving referrals. I'll explain that in a second. Uh, this model has a stellar track record for reducing detention. Some of the schools we work with don't give detentions anymore. Some of the schools we work with don't do discipline referrals anymore and don't do suspensions anymore either. Wow. Envision that. I have no trouble envisioning that. I've seen schools do it. I know what it takes to get there. The assessment of lagging skills and unsolved problems. Problem solving plan. In other words, two sheets to make the whole process proactive and then getting people good at solving problems problems collaboratively and proactively, and then the discipline referral becomes virtually obsolete. Now, in many of the schools we work with, what have they replaced the discipline referral with? Problem solving referral. Problem solving referral is when a classroom teacher is sending a referral to the office saying, I've got a problem I need to solve with old Billy here. Uh, can you help me get some coverage? It's not solve it for me. It's make it possible for me to solve it. And many of the schools that we work with have come up with some very sophisticated um, schedules so that solving problems with kids can be the priority it always should have been in that building. Because let's face it, most of the interventions that are associated with school discipline Solve no problems and teach no skills. Timeouts, don't. Holding a kid in from recess, solves no problems and teaches no skills. Keeping a kid after school, solves no problems and teaches no skills. Detentions don't, suspensions don't, expulsions don't. Hitting a kid doesn't. Pinning a kid to the ground doesn't. Throwing the kid in a padded room doesn't and weren't designed to. In other words, while a lot of folks who work in schools wonder, this is the obvious thing to wonder, this is logical, right? When does he think we're going to find the time to solve problems with kids? Mm, I find it's actually more a matter of commitment. Here's what I find. When schools commit to solving problems with kids, um, they find the time to do it. They create the time to do it. Me and my colleagues, I and my colleagues also help. I and my colleagues also help them find buried time to solve problems with kids before school, after school, during lunch, during recess, during the teacher's prep time, if the teacher has prep time. But once again, a lot of the schools that we've worked with do develop systems of coverage. And by the way, who's providing the coverage? Sometimes it's the principal. Uh, principals and assistant principals could either stay behind their desks and deal with the long line of kids that have assembled outside their office, sent to them by somebody else, or principals and assistant principals can um, provide coverage so that classroom teachers can get those problems solved. And now there's no line. Uh, school counselors, school psychologists, school social workers, these are the people we've always been sending kids to, and we've been saying to, and we've been saying, uh, to the school counselor, school psychologist, uh, school social worker, I got a kid, I need you to help. Mm. The school psychologist, school counselor, school social worker, principal, assistant principal, are the people who are facilitating problem solving in the building. They're helping people get good at it. They're creating mechanisms of coverage. They're keeping track. But they are not the people who are primarily doing the problem solving. That's classroom teachers. And when that is in place, People do not ask the question, where are we going to find the time to do that? People start saying, boy, this is saving us a lot of time. There are three ways to solve problems with kids. There are three ways to deal with problems with kids. So we have now moved on to the problem solving part of the model. 
you have three options and they are called plan A, plan B, and plan C. Um, notice at the top, the word unsolved is underlined. That clears up some confusion. See, if a problem isn't unsolved, you don't need a plan. It's not an unsolved problem. It's a met expectation, no plan needed. For example, if you're a parent and you have a kid who's um, having difficulty brushing his or her teeth before going to bed at night, um, you need a plan. It's, a, it's an unsolved problem. But if your kid is not having difficulty brushing teeth before going to bed at night, you don't need a plan. It's not an unsolved problem. It's a met expectation. No plan needed. If you work in a school and you have a kid who's coming to school on time and as often as you'd like, uh, you don't need a plan. It's not an unsolved problem. It's a met expectation. No plan needed. You only need one of these plans if the expectation is not being reliably met. Um, and you have three options. Uh, in the real world, you have three options. In this model, you're really only using two of them. Um, you can probably guess which one you are not going to be using very often in this model. Well, I'll be explicit. One of the plans you are using in this model is Plan C. Plan C is where you are setting a particular unsolved problem aside for now, not because you're capitulating, not because you're giving up, but because you're prioritizing. You've consciously, deliberately, and proactively decided we are eliminating this expectation for now. And not only is that not giving in, not only is that not giving up, that's brilliant. That's what I call expectation management. That's right. I think we should be replacing behavior management with expectation management. These are the expectations we have consciously, deliberately, and proactively decided. The kid doesn't even have to meet that expectation right now. It's gone forever. No, for now. When will it come back? When we get some of our higher priority unsolved problems solved. In the case of the very volatile, unstable, reactive kids that I tend to like working with, Plan C is also stabilizing. Because you see, any expectation you have set aside for now will not set in motion a challenging episode because it never came up. Which would I rather use to stabilize a kid? Plan C or an atypical antipsychotic medication? Definitely Plan C. It has no side effects. Are there kids that I work with who are still on meds for one reason or another? Yeah. What does that tell you? Some kids still need medicine because plans B and C didn't get you all the way there or weren't possible until we had medication on board. But, um, well, that just gave away the other plan that you're going to be using in this model. See, there's only two other plans left, A and B. Both represent a way to solve a problem with a kid. Just that there's one massive difference between them. With plan A, you're solving the problem unilaterally. With plan B, you're solving the problem collaboratively. You know which plan you're using in this model. Plan B, are we allergic to plan A in this model? No, not allergic. We just don't think it's a very good idea. But if a kid is about to dart in front of a speeding car in a parking lot, are you doing plan C? Saying, you know, that's not a very high price. No. Are you doing plan B? No, too late. You're doing plan A. You yank on the kid's arm. You save his life. If he blows up, so be it. But if three weeks later the kid has darted in front of a speeding car an additional 17 times and you've yanked an additional 17 times, I'll agree with you. Yanking is working at saving the kid's life, but yanking is not working at solving this problem you're gonna need a different plan. And if it's one of your high priorities, it's gonna be plan B. And if it's a low priority, if it is a low priority that this kid master parking lots at this point in that kid's development, then it could be that you find a way that that kid's not gonna find himself in a parking lot anytime soon until you get some of your higher priority unsolved problems solved. Plan A, do a check on time here. I think we're doing well. As you already know, plan A is where you're solving the problem unilaterally. 
to where the adult is deciding what the solution is and imposing it on the kid. How do you know you're doing that? The following words are usually the dead giveaway in one form or another. I've decided that. Now, notice not, I've decided that I have this expectation for you. That's not plan A. That's just having an expectation. That's still fine. But rather, I've decided that this is the solution to the expectation you're having difficulty meeting. That's plan A. Let me give you some examples to make sure that's clear. Because you're having difficulty doing your math before you go outside and play after school, that's not a plan. That's no plan. That's not plan A. That's no plan. That's just an expectation. Apparently, the expectation is that the kid do his math homework before going out to play after school. I've decided, here comes plan A, you're not going out to play until the math homework is done. That was plan A. That's unilateral. Because you're having difficulty getting along with Trevor on the school bus, that's no plan. That's just an expectation. The expectation seems to be that the kid get along with Trevor on the school bus. No plan yet. I've decided you're not riding the school bus until I decide you can again. That's plan A. Now, um, what's the downside of solving problems that way? There's many. I'm just going to cover four. Um, here's a big one. Plan A causes incompatibility episodes and challenging kids. Incompatibility episodes is what I refer to as challenging behavior. Plan A causes challenging behavior in challenging kids. Why? What just happened? You just threw plan A at a kid who doesn't have skills to handle plan A. What do you mean he doesn't have the skills to handle plan A? Nobody I know loves having other people impose their will on them. On those, believe it or not, relatively rare occasions that it actually happens in the real world, most of us have the skills to deal with it. Behaviorally challenging kids don't. What skills? You'll find a bunch of them listed in the assessment of lagging skills and unsolved problems. You throw plan A at a kid who doesn't have the skills to handle plan A. Um, he's going to look bad in ways that are lucky or unlucky. See, I don't, I don't, I don't put much stock in lucky versus unlucky. I don't think it's an, an important distinction. I just use lucky and unlucky behavior to get us away from diagnosis. Bottom line is. The behavior, whether it's lucky or unlucky, as you've already heard, is communicating the exact same thing. I'm stuck. There are expectations. I'm having difficulty meeting. Now an interesting paradox. Who gets more plan A thrown at them than any other type of kid? The unlucky ones. The ones least equipped to handle it well. More downsides. Plan A is not a partnership. Plan A is about power. Power causes conflict. Collaboration brings people together. Boy, there's a message for our times, eh? Plan A does not involve kids in solving the problems that affect their lives. Once again, why would you want to leave the kid out of the loop on that? And now for the last bullet downside of plan A, let me tell you a quick story just so I can make this example. True story from a classroom. Uh, here's plan A. Class, it's time to get to work on your social studies projects. I hope you quickly recognize that that was not plan A. That's just the classroom teacher announcing an expectation. No plan yet. I'm not doing my social studies project, says one of the students. Now we have an unmet expectation. Now that classroom teacher has three options, A, B, and C. Unfortunately, she's now stuck in the heat of the moment, so she's got to make a quick decision. Um, I later found out this kid hadn't worked on his social studies project in three weeks. Why, why are we finding ourselves in the heat of the moment yet again? Probably because we haven't done an else up on that kid yet. One of the most common refrains in schools that are implementing this model is, have y'all done an else up on that kid yet? If not, no wonder you're still getting surprised so often by things that aren't really Surprising. So the teacher's now in the heat of the moment. She has three options, A, B, C. Let's say she chooses plan A, which she did in real life. What did she say next? I've decided you must. There it is, the prototypical adult first response to a kid who's having difficulty meeting an expectation, insisting harder, but also plan A number one. Well, I'm not. 
Well, then I've decided you need to get out of my class. Fine. Plan number two. Now they're out in the hallway. Teacher's talking to the kid. What's your deal today? I'm not talking to you. You're not talking to me? Well, then I've decided you need to go talk to the assistant principal. Plan number three. Fine. Now the kid's in the assistant principal's office. I've heard you were being disrespectful to your teacher. Whatever. Whatever. Now you're being disrespectful to me. I've decided that you are now suspended for three days. Plan A number four. And now the final point about the downside of plan A. Four plan A's later. Do we yet know anything? And I mean anything about what caused the kid to say he wasn't doing his social studies project in the first place. We know nothing, which is why I tell people that solutions arrived at the use of plan A are not only unilateral, they are also uninformed. And I am allergic to uninformed solutions. They don't work, but we adults do them all the time. I got nothing else to say about plan A. Let's talk about the two plans you're actually gonna be using in this model, plan C and then plan B. With plan C, as you already know, you are setting a particular problem aside for now. Once again, not because you're giving in, not because you're giving up, but because you are prioritizing and stabilizing. There are two forms of plan C and plan B, emergent and proactive. Because you already did the ALSIP and because you already did the problem solving plan, which form of plan B and C should you be using 99.9% .9 of the time? Proactive. But here's emergency plan C. Class, it's time to get to work on your social studies project. See, I told you that was not a uh, plan. That's just an unmet expectation. No plan yet. I'm not doing my social studies project. Now you have an unmet expectation. Now you have three options, A, B, C. Let's say instead of plan A, the classroom teacher had chosen plan C. What would she have said next? Okay. Okay. A lot of adults get pretty wigged out about the word okay. They're going to have some questions. Okay forever? No, okay for now. Okay for everybody? No, okay for him now. Isn't everybody going to have some questions about that? I certainly hope so. Questions, kids, classmates, siblings, other teachers in the building, parents of the lucky kids have about the fair does not mean equal principle. Do you know there's not a classroom in North America where fair means equal? In every classroom in North America, somebody's getting something somebody else didn't get. You know what that's called? Good teaching. It's also called special education law. It's also called differentiated instruction. It's also called personalized learning. It's also called universal design. They're, they're in a household in North America where fair means equal. In every household in North America, somebody's getting something somebody else didn't get. Know what that's called? Good parenting. The definition of good parenting and good teaching is not treating everybody exactly the same. Treating everybody exactly the same is the surefire way to make sure nobody gets what they need. The definition of good parenting and good teaching is down at the bottom of the screen in yellow. It's being responsive to the hand you've been dealt. So if you should get some questions about that, um, you're ready. If it's a kid, they're not gonna ask how come fair doesn't mean equal. That's not how kids ask. Here's how kids ask. How come I gotta do my social studies project and he doesn't? You're ready. You've been waiting for this moment. Well, because he's having trouble for, with his social studies project, and you're not. What if I start to have trouble with my social studies project? Well, then, then I would help you with it. But are you having trouble with your social studies project? No, I didn't think so. You don't usually have trouble with your social studies project. You usually have trouble in math, which is why I give you the help you need in math. He's having trouble with his social studies project. That's why I'm helping him with that. So I got to do my social studies project. I'm having trouble thinking of any reason why you wouldn't. But that was emergency plan C. You don't want to be doing emergency plan C. You already did the LSIP. You already did the problem solving plan. You already know what you're working on. You already know what you're not working on. 
proactive plan C. Buddy, done proactively. You know how we've been working on a few things with you lately? We've been working on those double-digit division problems you've been having difficulty completing on the worksheet in math. You've been having trouble agreeing on the rules of the four-square game with Billy at recess. You know how you've been having trouble getting along with Trevor on the school bus in the morning? There's your three. Problem-solving plan is now full. I'm thinking, if we tried helping you with that social studies project that you fell behind on, it'd be too much. How about you don't have to work on the social studies project right now? No problem. It's going. How about me and you figure out what we're going to, what you're going to be doing during social studies while the rest of the class is working on their projects, and then we'll get back to the social studies project after we get some of these other ones solved. Did you just give in? Absolutely not. Did you just give up? Absolutely not. Are you still an authority figure? A whole lot more of an authority figure than you would have been if you were busy putting expectations on that kid you already knew he couldn't meet. Are the inmates now running the asylum? Absolutely not. Did you just prioritize? You did. I'm prioritizing is brilliant. That leaves us with only one plan left, and that plan is plan B. I got 12 minutes to cover it. Let's see how much I can cover in 12 minutes. Let me also see what I included in your slides. All right, now I know. Um, we're not gonna get through all of them. Solving a problem collaboratively involves three steps. And remember, you wanna be doing these three steps proactively 99% of the time. The empathy step, the define it all concern step, and the invitation step. The names of the steps do not matter that much. The ingredients matter a great deal. What is the main ingredient of the, of the empathy step? Information gathering. Gathering information from the kid so that you understand what's making it hard for the kid to meet that expectation. Kids have information we badly need. The information can only be had from the kid. Your number one source of information on what's making it hard for a kid to meet a particular expectation is the kid. Not you. No offense, but it's not you. As I'm always telling caregivers, it is not your job to know. It is your job to know how to find out. A bit of instruction on doing that in, in a minute or two. Second step is called the define it all concern step. This is where adults are entering their concerns into consideration. On the same unsolved problem, the, the exact same concern that might previously have led you into plan A is now leading you into plan B. Same concern, completely different approach to getting it addressed. What, what are we adults likely to be concerned about? Just two things, how the unsolved problem is affecting the kid how the unsolved problems affecting other people. Um, we often don't know what our concerns are, but I promise you, your concerns fall into just one or both of those two categories. Third step, the invitation. This is where you and the kid are collaborating. This is where you, you are literally inviting the kid to solve the problem with you, putting your heads together to come up with a solution, but a solution that must meet two criteria. Got to be realistic. Got to be something both parties are truly capable of doing. I cannot tell you how often I see adults signing off on solutions. They already know the kid can't do, or they already know they can't do. Even more important than that, the solution's got to be mutually satisfactory, meaning the solution addresses the concerns of both parties. Here's what I've been saying a lot lately, and world history bears me out on it. If the solution is not realistic and mutually satisfactory, I promise you, this problem is still unsolved. Think about that when it comes to current events. The empathy step. Let's spend a few more minutes in the empathy step. As you already know, the empathy step is where you are gathering information from the kid, especially related to what's making it hard for them to meet the expectation that you're talking with them about in plan B. 
The empathy step begins with an introduction. The introduction begins with the words, I've noticed that, and ends with the words, what's up? In between, you are inserting the unsolved problem that you intended to be talking with the kid about right now. If you worded your unsolved problems well, based on what you hear in that 45 minute audio recording that you're gonna to listen to on the Lives in the Balance website, I hope, um, here's what it would sound like. I've noticed you've been having difficulty completing the double digit division problems on the worksheet in math. What's up? I've noticed you've been having difficulty agreeing on the rules of the four square game with Billy at recess. What's up? I've noticed you've been having difficulty getting along with Trevor on the school bus in the morning. What's up? After you say what's up, one of five things is going to happen next. I hate being reductionistic, but it really is one of these five things that's going to happen next. Possibly number one, the kid's going to say something. Possibly number two, the kid's going to say nothing or I don't know. Possibly number three, the kid's going to say something like, I don't have a problem with that or I don't care. Possibly number four, the kid's going to say, I don't want to talk about it right now. And possibly number five, the kid's going to get defensive and say something like, I don't have to talk to you. Or worse, there you have them, the basic five. And now we are getting into some of the meat of the model, but that's okay. We can go into a little of the meat of the model. Here's the deal. After the kid says, what's up? After, after you say, what's up? The first thing the kid says is not going to give you the clearest possible understanding of the kid's concern or perspective on this unsolved problem. So you're going to have to probe for more information, a process I call drilling, drilling for information. And drilling is without question the hardest part of doing all of plan B. As I always say, it is where most ships run aground. It is where most captains abandon ship, mostly because us captains didn't know what to say on the screen right now, as well as on the drilling cheat sheet on the Lives in the Balance website are eight drilling strategies. So you'll never not know what to say. You're gonna be using some of these drilling strategies a whole lot more than others. Let me cover the ones that you're going to be using the most. And then we'll see if there's anything else I wanna cover. Obviously there's a gazillion things I could keep covering, but um, I wanna make sure that you all have a chance to ask questions. The three drilling strategies you're gonna be using the most are number one, number two, and number eight. Number one, reflective listening is your default drilling strategy. It's the one you are going to be using far and away the most. It's the one you should use if you don't know which one to use. Mirroring, simply saying back to the kid whatever the kid just said to you. Truth is, you could do an entire empathy step with just reflective listening and be just fine What's amazing is here's how a lot of people, their first reaction to reflective listening, they say, isn't that kind of basic? My response, basic, yes. But it's a, a very good way to have the kid feel heard, very good way to help the kid clarify his concerns, very good way for, for the kid to feel like his concerns are legitimate, very good way to help the kid keep talking. I could ask for no more from a drilling strategy. It's number one. Drilling strategy number two asking W questions, who, what, where, when, not why. I try very hard not to ask kids why. I find that when I ask kids why, what I get next is a regurgitated adult theory. Uh, way back when, when I used to ask kids why and used to talk to them about their behavior, things I don't do anymore, I was working with this four-year-old and I said to her, why do you do these things you do? Four years old, she said, I do it for negative reinforcement. Well, now, most adults actually don't know the true meaning of negative reinforcement. I promise you most four-year-olds don't either. Whenever I hear something that sounds like a regurgitation, I say to them, uh, what does that mean? She said, I don't know. I said, who told you that? She said, my dad. Then it's meaningless. A lot of adults get very excited if a kid says, I do it for negative attention. Um, I do it for attention. What does that mean? I don't know. Who told you that? My teacher. It's meaningless. Stick with who, what, where, when, especially what. 
and that will become one of your most common drilling strategies. And then strategy number eight, summarizing and asking for more. This is where you are summarizing all of the concerns you've heard in the empathy steps so far, and then asking for more. It is also the answer to the question, how do I know when the empathy step is done? You know when the empathy step is done when you summarize and ask for more, and there's no more. But before you summarize and ask for more and there's no more, you're gonna summarize and ask for more and there's gonna be more. So you're gonna be summarizing and asking for more in every multiple times in every empathy step, when there's no more, you're ready for the next step. And not a moment before. I know we adults were very easy, eager to get to the define it all concern step, but not till the empathy step is done. Don't worry, adults. Your concerns will be heard and your concerns will be addressed. Let me see if there's anything else we have time to cover here. I've already covered, let me cover the invitation a little bit. The uh, hardest part of the invitation is the wording. You want to start your invitations with the words, I wonder if there's a way. Now, what do you want if there's a way to do? You're wondering if there's a way to solve this problem. And you could say it that way, but if you say it that way, a lot of kids are going to look at you and say, what problem? So what you want to do instead, generically, is I wonder if there's a way for us to do something about ba 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 one party's concern. And also do something about ba 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 the other party's concerns. You are then giving the kid the first crack at the solution. Not because it's the kid's job to solve the problem. It's y'all's job to solve the problem. If the kid doesn't have any ideas, we hope you do. But it's very good strategy. Let's the kid know beyond a shadow of a doubt you're actually interested in the kid's ideas. And now y'all are working toward a solution together. But as you've already heard, a solution that must be two things. Got to be realistic. Both parties got to be able to do what they're agreeing to do. Got to be mutually satisfactory. The solution has to address the concerns of, those, of both parties. If those two criteria are not met, we don't have a solution. And this problem is still unsolved. Let me just see if there's anything else I want to cover. Not that one, not that one. I always add more slides than I can. Not that one. Here's the four websites that you would want to know about. Lives in the Balance is where all of the free resources are. CPS Connection and Lives in the Balance is where you will find um, a lot of trainings that we do. But on the CPS Connection website, you will also find about 150 providers around the world who've been certified to provide the collaborative and proactive solutions model. The Kids We Lose website is where you can get information about the documentary film that Lives in the Balance produced, The Kids We Lose, which um, exposes all of these very counterproductive things we still do to behaviorally challenging kids here in the year 2020. And as I mentioned earlier, truecrisisprevention.org is where you will find all kinds of free resources if you are interested in dramatically reducing and ultimately eliminating restraint and seclusion in your school. All right, nearly perfect timing. It doesn't always work out that way. Let me end the show, get the screen back, get rid of the slides, get rid of that. And are we, is the screen looking the way we want it to? I think it probably is. Yes, we, we see Enough. you. I see you. We see you. <laughs> do then, you uh, <laughs> let's do questions. Great. So one of the questions is, um, can people get a copy of the PowerPoint? Yes, I'll email it to you. Do you have emails of everybody who participated? Yes. And if they, and that's a good point. So if you guys will type, Dr. Green in the um, comments, then I can get your email and I'll send that out and we'll just make it as a PDF and people can have it. Cause I know there was like such rich information. Um, the other question I had, and then we're gonna go to some of our viewers questions is, when I was a teacher, um, I would try to say, what can I do differently as an adult if things weren't working out, right? Um, and so I know some parents have had, asked this question also, like, so where in the process of 
you know, identifying students' lagging skills, is there a place for the adults to say, what could I do differently? Maybe it's not a lagging skill. Maybe it's a lagging skill that I have as a parent or a teacher. So how does that play into it? Well, it's not unusual that when adults are using the assessment of lagging skills and unsolved problems with the kid as their primary reference point. Okay. They happen upon skills that they themselves are lacking. The good news is that kids are not the only ones whose skills are enhanced by solving problems collaboratively and proactively. The skills of their problem-solving partners are enhanced as well. So I actually don't usually find it necessary for adults to identify their own lagging skills. If it, if it happens, that's great, but it's not a formal process in the model. And um, the unsolved problems are actually not owned by the kid. The unsolved problems are shared because it's the adult's expectations. It's the kid who's having difficulty meeting them, but the unsolved problems are shared, right? So um, it's the adult's unsolved problem too. It's their expectation. So by identifying unsolved problems, you are actually identifying something that is shared by both parties. But here's the interesting thing. It's great that adults should ask, what can I do differently? And I often find that many adults just are trying so hard to, to help. Um, sometimes, usually, it's not a matter of trying harder. It's a matter of trying differently. Uh, often I see adults trying harder by adding more consequences or by they themselves coming up with new ingenious solutions for how to solve a problem that they actually know nothing about. It's not necessarily a matter of trying harder. It's often a matter of trying differently. Oh, exactly. Okay. Um, and so let me scroll here so I can see um, some of the comments. Some of them I not be able to find exactly, but I wrote down some too. So um, let me go there. So Sarah had asked, can one teacher do this or does it require the whole school to be on board to start using collaborative, proactive, you know, solutions? Well, once you close the door, I always say the kids are yours, but, and so you can, you can do an LSIP on, and you, by the way, you don't need an LSIP on every kid in your classroom. You just need an LSIP on the ones who are gonna have a lot of unsolved problems because those are the ones that you have to identify them and organize the effort for because you can't solve them all at once. So yes, an individual classroom teacher could do this in his or her own classroom. Problem is you are surrounded by an entire building that is not doing it. And so when the kid leaves you, they're going on to somebody else who's also not doing it, right? So while I think that's great and I wouldn't discourage it, I would push even harder on, make sure people in the building know what you're doing and make sure they know the success you're having with it and start a book study using Lost at School and see if you can gather some people together to see if the whole school can get moving on this. Great if you yourself are doing it, but not necessarily your long-term strategy. Long-term strategy is, can the rest of the building share in your success? Gather people around you. Um, start the movement, but you're not the only person doing it. Exactly. Um, and Renee asks, Renee's an advocate from the Chicago area. Oops, let me pull it up here. Are there study guides for your books that she's purchased one of your books years ago? There are study guides for lost and found and lost at school. Is there a study guide for the explosive child? Uh, you know what? There's too many things to keep track of these days, but I'll tell you where any study guides are going to be. If you go to the CPS store, on the CPS Connection website, you will find study guides for whatever books there are study guides for. And I'll also put that in the show notes that you guys will be sent. So then you can, you know, find that particular link. But yeah, I think it's an excellent idea as far as like a book club activity. Um, also, I have a membership group of parent advocates that are trailblazers. And I think that would be an excellent way that we could you know, continue this learning and help each other, right? And I think also your Facebook page, and I was gonna bring up that, that's another great way that people can connect um, 
and ask questions and get ideas. So I would encourage you to also like um, Lives in the Balance Facebook page, because that's a great resource right there. I heard that our Facebook group for parents now has 40,000 people participating. In it. Oh my goodness. And then there's, I think, like three subgroups that you can also join um, for specific areas. So that's another good um, part of their Facebook group. And Beth says, let me bring up her question. Another question for Dr. Green. How do you suggest drilling and asking WH questions with kids who hate answering questions? My son has ASD and answering questions is very difficult for him. I believe he feels put on the spot and anxious when asked a question. How do I work around this? Well, the first thing I would ask myself is, um, first of all, you may not have to work around it, but I would wanna know from your son what's making it hard for him to answer questions. Yes, I get it that we believe him to be anxious and we believe that he has, um, he's a little self-conscious about answering questions. But so often I find that our theories about kids are wrong. So the first thing I'd wanna do is ask, what's difficult for you about me asking you questions, right? And I don't know what you're gonna hear. You might hear, well, I can think of the words that I wanna say, I can think of what I wanna say, but I can't think of the words I wanna say them in, or, um, I can't think of what I want to say. I, I know the answer is in there somewhere, but I don't know what it is. Or I feel like you're judging me. Or I feel like there's a right or wrong answer. Or I feel if I tell you what's getting in the way for me, I'll be in trouble. I don't know what he's going to say, but that's the whole point, right? The whole point is that whatever he says, you guys will then collaborate on how to navigate that um, so that um, that's not so difficult for him anymore but I should teach your, your folks the strategy as well. When I have kids who are having difficulty responding verbally, I often teach them five fingers. Five means very true, four means pretty true, three means sort of true, two means not very true, one means not true at all. Okay. Then what I'm doing is I'm making statements. Now my theories might come in handy, they usually don't, but now they might. And all the kids gotta do is hold up fingers to let me know how true my theory is. And boy, do we extract a lot of information from either verbal kids who are having difficulty talking or even nonverbal kids by using that strategy. For nonverbal kids, there's a whole lot of other strategies, assistive technology, um, sign language, um, pictures. So um, sometimes people have the question when they hear about Plan B, can you do this with a nonverbal kid? We do this with nonverbal kids all the time. Yeah, I think that's excellent. And and I know um, Snow from South Carolina had asked again about your web, your Facebook page. So let me put that up here. Um, and then we had a comment from Jennifer where she says, how to start when a child essentially lives in brainstem. They are dysregulated so much of their day. Whether at school or home, it takes huge efforts to support the child to move out of the red zone, um, as Dr. Delahook refers to. And especially in a classroom where the child's nervous system becomes so overwhelmed just being in the class, let alone once the expectations of academics is given. Well, I, I would... Um, tend not, I understand the expression basically lives in brainstem and um, what red means to Dr. Delahook and others. But um, here's what I don't know. Here's the question that I would ask. Have y'all done an else up on that kid yet? If you haven't, then you don't, th then you're still going to be saying he lives in brainstem or he's in the red without knowing um, what's causing him to be in the red in the first place or why it looks like he's constantly in brainstem. That sounds to me like a kid who's gonna have a lot of lagging skills and a lot of unsolved problems. So now let's go back to the model. Once we identify those unsolved problems, we're gonna be working on two or three of them with plan B. We are eliminating plan A. Plan A is what puts kids into the red zone. Um, and we're gonna be putting a whole lot of those unsolved problems in the beginning in plan C. Plan C does not get, get kids to end up in the red zone. So between Getting rid of plan A, which only escalates kids, putting a lot in plan C, which greatly reduces their level of reactivity, we might actually find that this is a kid who's able to participate in plan B, but without the ALSIP, 
And without getting rid of A and without making plan C very big, we might never find that out. So I can't give an answer to a kid who's in brainstem without information about lagging skills and unsolved problems. Too often, when a kid is in the red a lot, the first thing people do is medication. But pills don't teach skills and pills don't solve problems. Pills might make it possible to solve problems and teach skills, but pills alone don't do that. So I'm not a quick person to send kids for meds either. Have y'all done an else up on that kid yet? Without that, I got no answers. Yeah, that's true. I mean, that beginning step is what, you know, really has to take place. Um, so here's a question from Snow, and she says, Dr. Ross Green, can we schedule you to meet with an entire school or a large district of about 120 schools? Just go to the CPS Connect, just go to the contact form on any of the websites. Okay. And um, contact us and I or one of my associates will be in touch with you and we'll figure it out. You know, and I, um, I know Yael Cohen from Boulder, she had seen you, I think it was last year in Denver. I can't find her question right now, but um, I think what her question was, was as an advocate, like how do we help <laughs> schools move away from using those traditional assessments when parents sign consent for an FBA and instead look at using the ALSEP as a replacement for those other kinds of assessments. Do you have any tips or strategies that have worked? Well, um, my usual strategy is to have a parent talk with the person in the school who they believe is going to be most likely to be receptive to this model because every school is different and I need to know who the key players are as it relates to making this happen, right? So that's step number one, frequently. Find out who you need to talk to, to make this happen. Number two, schools that do FBAs often have to do FBAs. So they're not going to not do an FBA. So if you say to them, I want you to do the ALSIP instead of the FBA, they're gonna shoot you right down. But if you say, I would like the assessment of lagging skills and unsolved problems to be the primary piece of information in forming the FBA that they might be more willing to do. And there is a CPS flavored functional behavior assessment on the Lives in the Balance website in the paperwork section. And there is also a CPS flavored IEP on the Lives in the Balance website in the paperwork section. And there will soon be a CPS flavored BIP behavior plan cool. and um, uh, uh, 504 plan on the Lives in the Balance website. So as we all know, the paperwork often uh, drives the ship Let's make sure we have CPS flavored paperwork in place, but let's first find out who's the person who I need to make sure makes this happen. Yeah, I think that's excellent. And I know I love your analogy of how the behavior is the symptom, the fever, you know, and we need to look for underlying that. And often I'll say that if I hear in an IEP meeting that the function of the behavior is you know, attention getting. The function of the behavior is to avoid. And it's like, so let's then look underneath that and right. see. And that's, I guess that's where I find like, then I can say, that's okay. Thank you for <laughs> identifying that. And now let's use the ALSEP to say, what are those lagging skills? You know, so I don't know. I don't know if that's appropriate or not. It is. What I say to people is, you know, what they'll say is he's getting, escaping, and avoiding. That's why the behavior is working for him. Right. The, the truth is we all get, we all escape, we all avoid. So if all we're saying about this kid is that he's getting, escaping, and avoiding, we've actually said nothing. That's not true of the rest, the rest of us. The question that the FBA needs to answer is, why is the kid going about getting, escaping, and avoiding in such a maladaptive fashion? And now the answer should be because of lagging skills and unsolved problems. So here's what I say. You do the assessment of lagging skills and unsolved problems, your FBA is practically written for you. You do the assessment of lagging skills and unsolved problems, your IEP is pretty much written for you. 
Yeah, so that is such a useful tool. And like Dr. Green said, that's on his website and it's free to use and it just, and then also watching the videos that are there of how you can process through that. Because the other thing that I see is like so many teams will just use that as a checklist. Yes, no, yeah. Instead of pausing after each one and talking about it. So yeah. I think that's the other part that's really important. Um, Christine says, Dr. Green, do you have any advice on influencing state policies? My state, Ohio, is revising its restraint and seclusion code, and the suggested revision, oh my, is worse than the original. Well, they didn't ask lives in the balance for our input, that's for sure, but here's the deal. What you want to do is get in touch with our director of advocacy at Lives in the Balance. Her name is Christine McIntyre. You can do that one of two ways. If you go to the contact page on the Lives in the Balance website, you can either fill out the contact form and we'll make sure that she gets it, or I think her email address is listed there anyway, so you can email her directly. Um, these are the things that um, Christine is on top of and things that she is helping parents and other caregivers try to become engaged on so that the next policy is not worse than the one that replaced it. Right, and if you go to the new um, website that Dr. Green has, this also has, um, you know, more focused information about restraints and seclusion. The other good Facebook page to go to is the Alliance Against Seclusion and Restraint, and I'll give you that in the show notes when I send them out. Um, but Guy Stevens and his team are doing excellent work, and they've done a lot of policy work, too, for um, changing state laws, district policy about restraint and seclusion. So um, that would be another resource that you could use. Uh, we have a couple more minutes because Dr. Green's got some other engagements. So let me see what other questions we have here. Um, so Yael, this is um, Yael's question. She said, I spent a day with you at the Trauma-Informed Schools Conference in Colorado. I found it's often harder to change the stuck behavior of the schools than that of a child. And that is an unsolved problem. You could not make it easier. You've put it all online. Yet as an advocate, when I've proposed to a number of individual schools that they use your model to alter behavior of an individual student, school IEP teams agree, and then it's often a train wreck. They only use bits and pieces. Well, um, yes, I've seen that happen. And if you're only using bits and pieces of the model, it's probably not gonna work. Um, you know, if you only use the carburetor and the, and the fuel filter and the tires on a car, it's not gonna drive. Um, so you might want to recommend that they contact us at Lives in the Balance so we can give them an assist and let them know what's really, really important to be doing. Um, even though we have a lot of free resources, we, we don't have any control, number one, over how much of those free resources people access and therefore what they use. So we're happy to get on the phone with them to um, see if we can help them pay attention to the right things and know that if they're only picking bits and pieces, and often they only pick the bits and pieces that are consistent with what they're already doing, um, it's not gonna fly. Right. And Natalie is just got recently hired to be a new special ed teacher in the fall. And she says, how would you explain not using seclusion to other staff? Exactly the way you heard me describe it on the slide with the red and blue bubbles. Um, I don't actually know any adults who want to be using seclusion. I don't know any adults who want to be using restraint, right? Um, so it's not that they want to be, it's that they often find themselves in the position of feeling that they need to. And what that tells us is that they, is that they are intervening very late in the process. We don't want them to be late. We want them to be early. So that slide is crucial for helping people understand not only the sequence and how they get there in the first place, but also what they should be doing instead. They should be identifying lagging skills and unsolved problems, assessment of lagging skills and unsolved problems, and they should be solving problems collaboratively and proactively, plan B. And then they start to recognize, all right, 
I know when I'm using seclusion. It's either because I haven't done the assessment of lagging skills and unsolved problems yet, or I'm not using plan C as fully as I should be. I'm still putting expectations on kids I already know they can't meet, or one slipped through the cracks and there's an unsolved problem that I didn't realize we didn't cover on the assessment of lagging skills and unsolved problems, and it came up in my classroom, right? Once again, an unmet expectation is only a surprise the first time it happens. It's not a surprise after that. Oh, exactly. Um, so I, I think we'll take one more question um, from Renee, and she says, please ask Dr. Green if we can do what he states regarding FBAs, but his thoughts on unique needs. I can't imagine why not. Yeah, I mean, totally. Um, so Dr. Green, thank you so much. You are so generous with your time all the resources that you have developed and that are available for parents, for teachers. Um, it's just, it's like such a treasure of resources that we can use. So I can't thank you enough. I know all the parents on here and the teachers are also putting in accolades for you and, and thanking you. Um, I know you have another training coming up I think June 25th, right, for parents? The one for parents is either 25th or 26th. I um, there's too many things going on for remember exact dates. Right. Um, but that's a three hour training. Um, whether that one is given what people got out of this one, um, that one will be specific to parents. So it may be worth people's while. Um, this was free for people, I think. But right. that's not free. So whether I would spend the 59 bucks on that, I'm not sure. The, the good news is that all the proceeds benefit lives in the balance, not me. So it's, it could be worth doing for that reason. Or you might just sort of hear things that a lot of people say to me, you know, I didn't get that until I heard you say it for the fourth time. Right. So maybe for that reason as well. Um, but there is a two-day training that we're doing in September that is also on the Lives in the Balance website, on the CPS Connection website. Um, that's a little pricier, but still very well priced. That might be the best thing to take them beyond what they've gotten out of this two hours today. Right. And I think for parents to know that there are a lot of um, disability organizations that offer scholarships. So if that would prevent you from especially taking the two day in September, know that there are places that you can you know, request um, scholarship funding. Um, it's such... It, it just impacts everything, right? It's going to change your life at home with your kids. Um, it's going to empower you to know more information that you can share with your child's school team. It's like incredible the changes that we can create. And I just, I just, you know, think of all the seeds that are being planted. And, you know, as we continue to encourage each other and um, coach each other along, the differences, the systemic differences that are going to be made for kids are like incredible. Definitely. So thank you. Thank you. And we thank will you for having me on. I, I appreciate it. We will stay in touch and um, you can email me your PowerPoint and I'll get that out to folks. But um, do you have any closing words of wisdom you would like to share with us? Um, well, my closing words of wisdom, just because it's topical right now, is that on the Lives in the Balance website, I write a real world segment every once in a while when something important is going on out there. And the one that I'm working on right now that'll probably be up on the website tomorrow is how the big problems that face us with regard to how some members of our society are still feeling like they don't matter. That problem can be solved collaboratively and proactively too. And doesn't the fact that there's differing points of view on that doesn't mean that there has to be conflict. It just means that we got to put our heads together. And since we got to live together, and there's really no choice about that, we might as well. Oh, exactly. So we'll we'll look forward to seeing that tomorrow. I I know I was also recently listening to your fireside chat, and that was also excellent with current events. So Thank you. um we will see everyone next week. If you would like to return, we will have more um, information and resources for you. And I am Charmaine Tanner. 
I'm your host of this weekly Facebook live show, The Art of Advocacy, and I look forward to seeing everyone again. So have a wonderful day and we will be in touch. Thank you.